they said we need people who uh, are willing to give their life, especially in suicide mission where they can take as much people as possible with them. They want to have loads of attacks at the same time in England, in Germany, in France. And they said, uh, would you mind to go back to Germany to, um, to stage attacks? My name is Rukmini Kalimaki. I work for the New York Times where I cover terrorism. I'm going to meet Harry Sarfo, a German citizen who joined ISIS last year. He was arrested when he returned to Germany and is now serving a three-year sentence in a maximum security prison outside the city of Bremen. Sarfo is the only European who was recruited by the branch of ISIS dedicated to carrying out attacks in Europe and is openly talking. Last week, he finished a year in solitary confinement. Now in the prison's general population, he's eager to share his story with me. You, you drove to Syria with, yeah. with your friend from Bremen, yeah. right? It took you four days, I think? Yeah, four, four days. Four days? I thought to myself, if I go down there, I live under Sharia, I would be much more happier than I live uh, in a country where there's no Sharia. Um, and how quickly after you got to Syria did you realize um, that you'd made a mistake? After one week. After one week? <laughs> <laughs> what happened yeah, after yeah. one week? After one week, I realized it's all bullocks. It's, it's, I can't take it. He witnessed teenage recruits being beaten senseless for not being able to keep up, a gay man being thrown from a building. But the dark memory of a beheading has lingered the longest. And then they tired him and put him, bent him over his chair. And there was this huge big man with a big, so, uh, big sword. And he chopped off his head. When you saw those things, did you turn away? Did you feel sick to your stomach? Yeah. What was your reaction? I lost, how can I say, I, um, when I, especially when I saw the beheading. I had to sleep for like, uh, I went straight away to, um, the, back to my, um, to my camp. I could tell my legs were shaking. I nearly fall, fell down because my body couldn't take it. To, to, uh, I don't know how to explain. I was shaky. I was shaking because uh, I was shocked. And people, everybody's screaming Allahu Akbar, and you think to yourself, there's nothing holy about this. Sarfa says he wanted to leave, but it wouldn't be easy. It was clear that he and other European recruits were especially valuable to ISIS and to its leader, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Then one man approached me and said, I heard you used to live in London, and I heard you, you were born in Germany. Um, do you have any contact, con contacts or any networks in Germany who are willing to give their life for the Amir Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi? And I told him, no, I don't have no one. I'm not willing to go back as well. Then he said, um, especially in Germany and in uh, England, it's lacking of people who are willing to give their life. Um, my friend asked him, so what about France? Because when they were asking about England and Germany, that they don't have people who are ready to give their life. And then my friend asked him, what about France? And they start laughing, and but really serious laughing with tears in their eyes. Uh, saying, oh, in don't worry about France, Matthew Mushkila in Arabic means no problem. France is, uh, don't worry about France, France, we have enough people. Wow. And that was um, probably in April. In April, yeah. So five, six months before the November yeah. 13th attacks. Exactly. Yeah. Interesting. And what did, what did you say? I said, no, I'm not willing to go back and I don't know any persons. <coughs> and, yeah. Uh, regarding how many of the fighters sent by the, the, the Secret Service of ISIS have returned back to Europe. Do you have any idea? It's quite a lot. You can tell now that many people still in their heart feel as part of the Islamic State and they still have ties and they still have friends in the Islamic State so it's easy for the people in the Islamic State to get hold of them and yeah. Would you say dozens, hundreds? Or it's hundreds, yeah, definitely. Do you think any from Canada or America? There are Americans, but the Marseille, the guys from Marseille said that uh, for America and Canada, it's much more easier to get them over the social network. And because they say America is that dumb, that they, cause they have uh, open gun policies, policies, policy. It's as easy to get radical Muslims to buy guns. Uh, they say we can radicalize them easily, and if they don't have no criminal record, they can buy them guns themselves. We don't need to have no contact man who has to provide guns for them. 
Um, tell us about the day when you were asked to do this propaganda video. Okay, right. There were two or three cars at the beginning, but we, ended, we only ended up using two of them, both filled up with five people. Um, one car was driven by the Australian, uh, he, ca he calls himself Self Sheikh, uh, Abu Osama Al Garib. Abu Osama arrived with seven, uh, seven Syrians. As he, he said, were Assad so soldiers of Assad. The hands were tied and the eyes were, um, as well, clothed. They couldn't see nothing. And then he started asking, who wants to execute them? And everybody was raising their hands. I didn't raise my hand. I mean, it seems to me that many times along the way you said no. Yeah. You said no when they asked you to go back as a suicide yeah. bomber. Um, you said no a second time when they asked you a second time. You didn't take the gun. Yeah. They weren't getting suspicious of you yeah, at this they point? Were, they were, uh, when I said, I, I don't want to take part in the execution, they were all looking at me and they were asking me, why are you here then? Mm -hmm. right. And then they said, okay, obviously then, but you have to take the black flag in the video. And how can I say, they said, you, you're black, you're German, it, it's going to be a good look for the video if a black man carries the black flag. And obviously I said yes to the lesser, because it was le less worse than killing a person. And then what happened? The whole road was packed. Everybody came out of houses, people on motorbikes and cars. And they were filming everything. The Syrian guy was speaking, he started speaking and said, I'm not part of Assad's uh, troops. I'm actually Sunni, same as you. And he was actually a, a, a imam, as he said. And Abu Osama quickly uh, shot him. And then everybody else in the line started shooting. And seeing that, obviously, uh, got me thinking about a lot of things. Yeah. At that point, you were already having doubts? Yeah, already. I had doubts before that, and that actually, how can I say, showed me that it's totally wrong. And I downloaded myself a Google map, and I start uh, waiting up the options, how I can leave this place. But I remember everybody was telling me it's impossible to leave. Everybody was, even the European guys who wanted to leave, they said it's impossible. So my hope was like, was actually zero. I told myself I have to try anyway. For days, Sarfa studied the patterns of the authorities guarding the border of the Islamic State territory. And then, during evening prayers one night, he made a dash for freedom. And uh, it didn't take long, and then they saw me. Like, it was after 30, quite, after 30 minutes, start shooting. People hunting me, they tried to hunt me down. And it was kind of a, how can I say? Yeah, it was a long journey. I was kept on running, hiding. I had to hide. Uh, I was hiding in mud. I, I put mud on my face, on my clothes, covered in mud. And the border control came with a with, with a jeep, and these I don't know how we call it, the big light. This is the big the big lights. We have a big light, and they were looking, and there were a couple meters. If they put a couple meters more left, they would have found me, but they didn't. Sarfo managed to avoid detection, and after a 10-hour trek, he made it across the border into Turkey. I heard the Adan, the call to prayer, and I could hear the accent, the Turkish accent, so I realized, okay, I'm actually in Turkey now. Yeah. Amazing. How did you feel when you reached there? I was grateful, obviously. I was happy. Yeah. And when you took the flight back to Bremen, did you suspect you were going to be arrested? Yeah. I knew from the beginning that I'm going to get arrested, but I didn't really care about it. When Sarfu is released from prison, he'll likely face a European public that is skeptical of his redemption and may continue to see him as a threat. But German officials say he can become a credible voice, warning others of the reality of the Islamic State. The Islamic State sees you as a traitor. Yeah. Now, your own country is most likely going to brand you as a terrorist yeah. for what you did. Where do you see your own life going? It's hard to say. Obviously, in prison, um, you, don't, you, don't, you don't know what's going on outside and how people feel. Everything can happen. But I think I'm doing the right thing. 
Um, you know, we see nowadays many families who lost their children who don't know why and how it happened that they've been being re radicalized. And I hope I can help them as well because my own mom was going through the same situation. And uh, I don't mind if they brand me as a traitor because what they're doing is, has nothing to do with the Islam and the principles of Islam.